While we remain vigilant about the threat of foreign terrorism, ideologically motivated domestic violent extremism now poses the most lethal and persistent terrorism-related threat to the homeland today. The January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol and on American democracy is a searing example of this threat. That was the new Homeland Security Secretary testifying at, Ca uh, at a Capitol Hill hearing this week. A few weeks earlier, FBI Director Christopher Wray spoke out about the Capitol riot also during a congressional hearing. I was appalled that you, our country's elected leaders, were victimized right here in these very halls. That attack, that siege, was criminal behavior, plain and simple, and it's behavior that we, the FBI, view as domestic terrorism. On the heels of those hearings, the Director of National Intelligence issued a new report warning about all of the things Ray and Mayorkas were talking about. Here's part of it, quote, Newer sociopolitical developments, such as narratives of fraud in the recent general election, the emboldening impact of the violent breach of the U.S. Capitol, and conspiracy theories promoting violence, will almost certainly spur some domestic violent extremists to try to engage in violence this year. That report also says the most lethal threats come from white supremacists who are motivated by ethnic hatreds and by militias who typically target law enforcement and government facilities. And as we showed you at the top of the program, the number of ethnic hate crimes are already soaring in this country. Joining us to discuss, Camilla DeShals. She's a senior reporter for Business Insider who covers the Justice Department. Camilla, it seems to me that we're looking at simultaneous increases in two different kinds of hate, or at least the manifestations of hate. One is an increase in hateful rhetoric, people feeling liberated to be more hateful or at least less respectful of other people's identities and identity sensitivities. For example, Donald Trump's tweets. I'm sure you've seen the study from UC San Francisco that showed a spike in the use of anti-Asian hashtags after Trump tweeted out Chinese virus. But there's nothing inherently illegal about that or in tweeting that. The other, of course, is the increase in hate crimes when people act upon that hate, whether they were inspired or encouraged or otherwise validated by the people increasing the rhetoric. You cover the Justice Department and the FBI. They focus on the latter aspect when hate turns violent. But... I'm wondering if the rhetoric is part of what they're looking at as well. I think they're trying to combat this on two fronts. They understand that the rhetoric that the past president has used, um, Donald Trump, and that people are continuing to use when describing Asian Americans can be completely detrimental and can incite more violence against this community that has been attacked for, you know, not just the span of this year, but, you know, it's really important to note that the attack, the recent attacks against Asian Americans, you know, has just highlighted a ongoing problem that's existed in U.S. history for, you know, years, for decades. I think the DOJ is trying to be a little bit more proactive on this about, you know, Merrick Garland has spoke out um, saying that he's, you know, does that hate crimes have teared at the fabric of the society. Several DOJ officials have also condemned the recent attacks. But they have also put out a plan just stating that they are implementing more, more measures to try to combat hate crimes against Asian Americans, conducting meetings with um, people within the communities um, of these groups that are being impacted. They're also trying to um, go out and, you know, do outreach, public outreach, to have more people feel comfortable reporting these types of um, assaults and attacks that have been really happening against the Asian American and spe Pacific Islander community. <laughs> While not a hate crime in and of itself, an Intel community report this week said that the Capitol riot helped embolden hate groups and could lead to even more incidents of hate down the road. Is that impacting how justice is prosecuting the riot, uh, the rioters, not just because of the crimes on January 6th, but with an eye to try and prevent future incidents? I think a lot of people are looking at how not only the DOJ tries to investigate what happened on January 6th, but also the charges that they're going to um, give to the rioters who were responsible that incited this violence. Um, and that's a really big concern is how they're going to be charged. You know, we've seen um, a few of the rioters be charged, um, given fines, um, being let go, um, given more misdemeanor charges or given plea deals. And that's going to be really big. I think there has been a lot of concern that um, 
these rioters are not going to be properly charged or, you know, they're just going to be given plea deals and kind of walk away from this. And, uh, you know, DOJ has kind of talked in depth about how they're really trying to go after um, the people that were on Capitol Hill during the riot. And, you know, they have charged more than, you know, 2,000 people, but they're really proactively trying to look at how they're going to be charged certain individuals who they found that really incited the violence on Capitol Hill. We're also getting an enhanced focus on specific groups whose members were involved in the riot. Most people had heard of the Proud Boys, but also the Boogaloo Boys, Rise Above Nation, Three Percenters, the Oath Keepers, and of course QAnon. Attorney General Garland reminded us all during his confirmation hearings that the Justice Department was created in part to go after the KKK. I'm wondering if there's a sense now that the Biden Justice Department is going to go after these groups as well as the individuals as part of the prosecution of the Capitol riot. Well, Mayor Garland did state um, that he wants to be more proactive about even how the U.S. addresses and combats domestic terrorism. And this is something that, you know, all eyes are on him on how DOJ is going to move forward, not just looking into what happened January 6th, but also monitoring um, the threats, the potential threats of domestic terrorism that's that may happen in the future. And so I think a part of that is, you know, the DOJ put out a report just stating what they believe is um, what defines domestic terrorism. And I think that in itself is a really big deal because this is kind of the grounds that they're going to go on when looking at different groups that are coming up in the U.S. that are kind of rising more and gaining more of a following or a higher profile. Um, but, you know, I talked to um, an association that represents a lot of FBI agents, and basically they were trying, to, they were telling me that they don't want the FBI or DOJ to specifically put out a list and say, here are the groups that we define are, you know, domestic terrorism groups, because, you know, they want to make sure that the DOJ is doing it in a way um, that's, you know, trying to go at this in a more proactive approach rather than, you know, create more problems or, you know, mis misidentify certain groups and say that they're domestic terrorism groups when they're not. Um, and so it's it's very something that I think the DOJ is going to try to handle very methodically and very carefully because this is a sensitive issue that, you know, there's a lot of reports saying how domestic terrorism, um, the rise of domestic terrorist deaths. And so this is something that they're trying to do diligently. A number of rioters have claimed as part of their defense that they thought that they were called to the Capitol by President Trump. He called for them to come. I'm wondering, are, are prosecutors prepared for that defense? Will it work? And could that possibly lead to any legal jeopardy for Trump himself? What's well, interesting that some of the charges we've seen is that some have been charged with trespassing. Um, but, you know, and I, I think this is what a lot of people are, reporters like myself, are really looking at is to look at all the people who have been charged and see what kind of charges um, did prosecutors go after. You know, we can expect with especially leaders of certain groups that they're going to be charged more heavily than probably others who are not really affiliated and they just came and, you know, got swept, just went over to the Capitol Hill um, and still participated. But, you know, it is interesting to see how they prosecute certain people and the role that these people played and even leading up to the events that happened in January 6. Camilla DeChalice is a senior reporter covering the Justice Department and the federal courts for Insider. Camilla, thanks so much for the time. Appreciate it. Thank you. Up next, we pivot to the stimulus plan. We'll speak with a restaurant owner who says the government has been a huge help as he's been dealing with COVID and all the issues it's been causing. That and much, much more as we continue with Richard French Live on this Friday night.